All right. Welcome to The Last Hope. It might be The Last Hope because there's no more room in this hotel because this conference keeps growing every time we have it. I want to thank you all for supporting this community, 2600 Magazine, uh, and coming this weekend to share knowledge. Um, the hacking community is a community, and the 2600 community has looked after a lot of people and supported a lot of people that have gotten um, snagged by law enforcement for dubious reasons. Uh, when I was doing a nationally syndicated radio feature called The Technophile, Emmanuel got in touch with me and told me that a guy by the name of Bernie S. was incarcerated for ridiculous reasons. Uh, and I took that to the airwaves, and ever since then I've seen Emmanuel put uh, the resources of 2600 Magazine behind people uh, that have been accused of things that they didn't do. So I think we should give a round of applause to Emmanuel and 2600. <laughs> Two years ago, um, we had a bit of an incident at the HOPE conference right before <laughs> this next gentleman was uh, going to give a discussion. Some federal agents arrived and snagged him and took him away. Um, and all charges were dropped uh, very quickly afterwards. Um, but it does show you that people are paying attention to this community. Um, and Stephen was going to be giving a discussion. Uh, the discussions he usually gives at this conference is called Privacy is Dead, Get Over It. Um, he's working on a new project called Stealing Your Own Identity. He's a director of a, a detective agency uh, and a private investigator. And we've all been kind of waiting for the uh, thugs to storm in and grab him before he hits this microphone. But we're glad you're here. Stephen Rombaum. This working? The problem is that you may call them thugs, I call them colleagues, so it was a little, uh, <laughs> it was a little surprising for me. I am Steve Rambam, and this talk is Privacy is Dead, Get Over It. Today, in the uh, expanded amount of time that they've given me, uh, I and Rick Dakin and a few other people who'll be joining me on the podium hope to give you an overview of what's changed in the past 10 years with databases, privacy, investigation, just how much of your life is out there on display. The first thing that I want to tell you is with any starting point, your name, your address, your phone number, if you call me and your number accurately comes up on my caller ID, within 30 seconds I know your name, your address, your social security number, your date of birth, your sex, your driver's license number, and your criminal record. Given about five minutes, I know a lot more. Marriage and divorce, employment, corporations, property, lawsuits, your photo. Everything today is now available if you know where to look. And not just the things that you would expect not just identifier information, not just residence, not just employment, but without leaving my desk as an investigator, it's possible for me to determine if you're gay or straight or bi, if you're black or white or Hispanic or Asian, if you're a Republican, if you're a Democrat. Everything that there is to know about you is cataloged and indexed and cross-referenced and available. Now, part of what this, this fellow sitting right here is Rick Dakin, who is uh, arguably the bravest guy in the room, as you're going to see. <laughs> Rick, now, by the way, just a show of hands. How many of you were at the, the talk at the Stevens Institute? OK, about 15%. For those of you that were at the Stevens Institute talk, some of this is going to be familiar about 20% of this talk. Two years ago, I went on the Off the Hook radio program, and I asked for a, a volunteer, a privacy victim. 
somebody who would let me do, as I called it, a digital proctology exam, <laughs> and really determine everything that there is to know about them. And Rick, who is a, is a, is a brave guy, volunteered. Feedback issue? Okay. <laughs> Somebody did that on purpose. Rick, as you're going to see. It's closer to the mic, not farther. Well, I'm. Aha. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you, AV guy. You were the guy that they all called when we were in school to come set up the projector, right? Rick, as you're going to, st is this working? Can you all hear me in the back? Okay. Rick, as you're going to see, not only signed the most incredible waiver that ever existed, <laughs> but allowed me to look into every bit of his life. And in a period of about four and a half hours on a Wednesday morning, from breakfast until lunch, I'm going to show you what we were able to find out about Rick. Now, before we continue, let me tell you what we're going to cover today. We are not going to cover government databases. We're not going to cover NCIC or TEX or NLETS or any of the FinCEN stuff or the new fusion centers that are being put together or anything like that. We are going to cover private databases. And we're going to do that for two reasons. Number one, I want to get you, I want to give you a sense of what's out there. Number two, today the government, when it investigates you, more and more and more it outsources your privacy invasion. It calls ChoicePoint, it calls Accurate, which are, by the way, now the same company. <clears throat> it calls private individuals such as myself. The first thing that's changed, now I've been giving this talk since the first HOPE convention. And let me tell you what has changed in the past 10 years. What's dramatically changed? First of all, computing power and speed, obviously. I have in my office today, running a database called peoplefinder.net, more computing power, more storage space, and more individual records than the FBI had in their computers 15 years ago. Everything has changed. It is now possible to put together a database that 20 years ago would have been a fantasy for the FBI. Digitalization of everything. It used to be that if somebody wanted your medical records in a computer, they would have to sit down and key them in. Or they would have to scan in paper files. Everything now at the point of origin is digital. It goes into the databases immediately. Everything from when you buy something with a credit card when you make a phone call, when you call an 800 number, when you renew your driver's license, when you get a passport, all of that is in the database instantly. When you use a Metro card, when you use an iPass. The stuff that's not in the database because it's too old, it's being OCR'd, it's being scanned in and entered into the database at blinding speeds. And the main reason is the hardware lets you do it in a way that was unimaginable 10 years ago. Just for grins, British Telecom took all their old phone books and in one week scanned them into the database. You can now look up somebody's phone number from 100 years ago. Cell phones. We're going to talk about cell phones a lot today. But cell phones change everything. I am able to know who you talk to, where you are what you do, what you like, who you hang out with just from your cell phone. Cross-referencing and artificial intelligence scripts. It's no longer enough just to have the data to say this is Bob's driver's license, this is Bob's social security number, this is Bob's telephone number. Now, when your telephone number comes up on my caller ID, also on the computer comes up your name, your address your driver's license number, more often than not your phone number, businesses that are cross-referenced. Everything is linked together. What's the reason for all of this? Because your life, your history, what you like, what you dislike, 
what you might buy, where you might travel, what I can sell you is worth billions of dollars. The main thing that's changed, other than self-contributed data, cell phones, cameras, and precision targeted marketing. We're going to cover these three things today in some length. Each of these deserve their own seminar, as you're going to see. The main thing that's changed is attitudes towards privacy and attitudes towards data. If, if the boneheads at New York Magazine can figure out that privacy is dead, it's dead and buried. People put things up on their MySpace page today that when I was a teenager, when I was 25, I wouldn't have dreamt of telling my closest friend. But I can go on a MySpace page today and find out what's your sexual orientation? What drugs do you do? Uh, how many people did you have sex with last week? And, and where? Now, when I talk about ridiculous self-contribution of data, the perfect example is Twitter. You know, if somebody told me about Twitter, I would have thought it was a joke. We're going to put up a website where people can post every 15 minutes what they're doing. <laughs> Guess what? 40 million contributors. Now, as an investigator, thank you very much. <laughs> But as, as, as somebody over the age of 40, I, I don't get it. I don't get, first of all, I don't believe anybody would care where I am every 15 minutes. And if they do, they're a stalker. Why would I want to tell them? <laughs> but this is what's going on. I, I won't even, well, I will read you some of this. And it's ridiculous. 13 hours ago, watching Malibu's Most Wanted. 11 hours ago, uh, I got my bumpers to glow to the max. 10 hours ago, just woke up. Listening to XM. 8 hours ago, getting ready for work. 7 hours ago, going to Avacoli's for pizza. And then all the way up to the top. 36 minutes ago, just got out of work. Okay. Here's an example of something, again, Changing mindset. This would have never occurred to me, ever. And it wouldn't have been possible five years ago. There's a guy, Hassan Allahi, who was mistakenly accused by the FBI, something I can relate to, <laughs> of, of being a bad guy. And he was picked up and he was accused of being a terrorist, and I don't know precisely what they did to him. Uh, it could have been anything from Guantanamo to giving him a spanking. But he didn't like it. And what was his solution? He set up a blog called trackingtransients.com. And every couple of minutes, he posts where he is and stands in front of the place and takes a cell phone photo and uploads it. So if the FBI says, you were bombing the Greyhound bus station, he can say, no, I was at Domino's Pizza. <laughs> and here's an example. Here's the photos of where he was. When I last looked at his site, which was about two weeks ago, present location on Friday, 27th of June, 2008, 7.48 in the morning, with photos and a little arrow. Now, now granted, this is a really nervous guy. Maybe, <laughs> maybe with reason, but this is not something that 10 years ago would have occurred to anybody or been possible. And by the way, if it's not enough just to send a text message, well... <laughs> You've got udders where you can put up a photo. The one on the left says, 36 minutes ago, just cleaned up my room. And he's got a picture of his nicely made bed. Again, I'm old school. I don't get it. And you have quick where you can post videos. You know, when I was in high school and they forced me kicking and screaming to take philosophy, the, 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 the big question that we all know, the Father Guido Sarducci question is, if a, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, did it really fall? Well, today it's, if something happened and it's not posted on the net, you know, did it really happen? So everybody posts everything to the net. Things that would have been, by the way, raise your hand if you know what this is. 
All right, everybody knows what it is. I mean, frankly, I just love watching this. It's, it's Saddam Hussein being hung. But who would have imagined the guy would have whipped out a cell phone during one of the most significant historical events in the past 20 years, and a half hour later it would have been up on the net? Unimaginable, but this is the new reality. Now, let's talk about obvious sources. Sources that I, as an investigator, use many times a day, and I thank you for contributing to. All self-contribution of data. Obviously, MySpace, number one. MySpace will tell me your name, your age, where you live, where you went to school, who your friends are, which I have to tell you is a wonderful thing for an investigator, because I can go and interview them. Your musical tastes, books, friends, residences, hobbies, children, parents, siblings, and politics, drug use, sexual orientation, criminal history, email addresses, finances, I, which I can't believe. Personal conflict, psychological problems. Now, a few truly ridiculous examples. <laughs> this is a real web page. You can go and look it up through the MySpace search engine, unless she's in this room and running out the back door and yanking it down. <laughs> I mean, this is actually, now by the way, this is a public web page. I covered her face because she's 17 years old. And people make, as you can see, remarkably stupid mistakes when they're 17. And this is being immortalized. I can't see where the camera is, but this will be out on DVDs by tonight. So I didn't want her face up there. But as you can see, the caption of this page is, I'm a big badass slut and I love sucking. I won't say it. Let's try to keep this a PG DVD. The thing, that crack, the thing that cracks me up is she says her current state is sleeping and she's happy. Probably because she spent all night. <laughs> you see, that's why I got picked up by the feds. <laughs> and people put up there on their web pages drug use. Here's Ganja Girl who gives her name, where she lives. Uh, her interests are hanging out with friends, partying, i.e., if you don't know what partying is, i.e., drinking, getting high, and weird kinky sex. She's bisexual, a Pisces, uh, a graduate of Hiles Anderson College, and the manager of the pizza factory. Okay. Maybe not the manager of the pizza factory anymore, but pretty remarkable she put that up there. Any ringing cell phone gets confiscated. Where, where's... <laughs> Where's my security team? I want that. <laughs> now, oh, this is, this is a hilarious one. <laughs> the, guy, the guy puts his name up there. He's 19 years old. The motto is just effing kill yourself. He gives his name, his date of birth, where he's from, his background. And uh, what's his plans? He plans to become a police officer. <laughs> Oh, here's another guy. As you can see, he's pointing a shotgun into the camera. He gives his name, his date of birth, his city, his state. He says he currently smells like gunpowder and Axe body spray. He's a detention officer. And when it says, tell us about your family, he says, what family? OK. <laughs> oh, by the way, I gave a talk at Cal Poly Pomona and uh, the, at, the, at the Secure IT conference. I gave an example of how easy social engineering is these days when you can get the entire background on somebody. And before I gave the talk, the local organizer said, try to find something, you know, specifically about our school so people can relate to it. <laughs> well, here's the Cal Poly Pomona Stoners. And, and, and their reason for existence is if you go to Cal Poly Pomona or live nearby, you love the herb and you're down for group sessions, you need to join this group. Sadly, the day after I gave the talk, every single one of the people on this page were arrested. Now, yeah, really true, really true. Two, it was either the day after or two days after. And I got a lot of nasty emails to which I responded two things. Number one, you're a moron, you put it on MySpace. 
and, 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 and number two, I can't believe that, that, you know, campus security hasn't heard of MySpace. Not everything on MySpace is funny. Here's, here's a, a, a poor girl who, who lost her child, and she, I, I've blacked out some of this. I took down her name and her date of birth, and she put her, her parents' full names up there and her three sisters' names up there, and she says, my name is so-and-so, I'm 18 years old, and she talks about how she lost her child because she was physically abused. Gives all of her personal details, her photo, and frankly, the most intimate detail of her life. And I put this up here because it's an example of what's acceptable these days. This is why things have changed, because self-contribution of data has changed. Here is Rainy DeMalco. Rainy DeMalco says, and she gives her name and her place of birth, and she talks about being abused by her parents. She talks about being pimped out. She talks about beating somebody to death with a rock. Uh, pretty remarkable. Now, I don't know it, if this is a real page or not. I think it probably is. Um, I've put this up here because it's a current page, and you can verify it. If I was putting up all the pages I've seen, I, there's a worse page that I've seen where a girl talks about being sexually abused when she, she gives her name and her date of birth and city state like this, and she talks about being sexually abused as a child. And um, all, of, all of her details and talks about being pimped out by her uncle and contracting AIDS. And it says, there's a, there's a space where it says, what do you want the most? And she says, having sex with my father one more time so my AIDS can kill him. And that's, that's something that somebody felt comfortable putting up on MySpace. Here's a MySpace group of people who have been raped. They put up their names, they put, put up their photos, for example. If you look at the center one, odd girl, very easy to identify her. These are people who talk about being raped and give all their details. You know, little, little sobering. But this is the current state of affairs. There is no more sense of privacy, not because it's been ripped away from you in some Orwellian way, but because you flushed it down the toilet. And again, as an investigator, thank you very much. Facebook, Friendster, Bebo, all the same. And by the way, all of these sites and MySpace give me one of the three holy grails of an investigator, which we're going to talk about. Number one, your photo used to be impossible to get. Now it's a joke to get it. I remember when I first started as an investigator, I would pay sources at the DMV or I would pay people at the PD up to $500 for your driver's license photo. So when I was watching your house, I'd know who the right guy coming in and out was. Now I just have to... Now I just have to go to MySpace. Second thing, your location. Before this is over, you're going to see how I can find your current location without leaving my desk. And the third is, who do you know? Who has inside intimate information about you that I can interview? Holy grail number three. Thanks to the net, no problem. I know everybody you've gone to school with, classmates. I know everybody you hang out with. I know everybody who you consider a close friend. Oh, and by the way, so I don't have to go to the trouble of actually going to three websites? You put it all on one website. Now let's talk about some of the people who actually make money off of knowing all of this information about you. I I'm not even going to ask you who uses Amazon, because the answer is everybody in this room, unless you're the Unabomber and living in, in the woods without a computer. But think for a second about what Amazon knows about you. They know where you live, where you work. They know about your finances. They know what you like to read. They know what music you like to listen to. They know every interest of yours, every like, every dislike. All of the things that make you, you. Essentially, they've got a database of everybody in America's soul. Do I want to know if you... If, are you Jewish, for example? If I'm, if I'm, if I'm an anti-Semite and I want to make a database of Jewish people, no problem. 
Just look at the books that people order. Are you gay? You're going to buy a certain type of book or, or a certain type of video for sure. Do you have an interest in Belize? Well, you've probably bought a guidebook on Belize. Do you like to listen to Bob Marley? You've bought a tape or a CD or whatever, a Bob Marley tape or CD. Anything that there is to know about you, I can extrapolate out from what you do on Amazon. And even if you don't buy it, by the way, if you're logged in, they, they, they cache your search history. Let me give you an example. I am, thank God, in perfect health. But a little old lady lives down the hall from me in my apartment house, said, you know, I know you have a computer. I can't really get out. I need a book on, on alternative methods of dealing with kidney problems. You know, can you look on, on the internet and see, is there a book that deals with, you know, drinking berry juices and that sort of thing, herbal remedies, and buy the book and I'll pay you back for it. And I said, sure, and I did that, and I got her the book. Now, whenever I log on, they recommend to me books on kidney care and kidney cancer and herbal remedies and whatever. eBay, PayPal, and Skype. Okay, again, reflect for a moment what they know about you. They know where you live, where you work, everything about your finances, including your bank account, every single thing that you've ever expressed interest in, bid on, who you talk to on the phone, where you are a good part of the time, because when you log on, when you use the Skype system, when you use, and especially if you're going to be using it over the iPhone soon, you know, pretty much everything there is to know about you. And by the way, eBay, PayPal, and Skype, it's the same company in case you didn't know. Now, let's talk about what I like to call subpoena target number one. I usually give this talk to law enforcement groups. And the purpose of this talk for most law enforcement officers is to know what's out there so they can subpoena it and get your records. Or if they're federal agents, just write a national security letter and, and it has to be turned over. But either way, to get it. Welcome to Skynet. Google. If you don't take anything else away from my talk today, here's what I need you to take away. Google is a private company that you have no control over. You have no right and no ability to influence what they gather about you and what they do with that information. And the truth is, most people, when they think of Google, they think of a great utility that solved all the problems of finding things on the internet a few years ago. That's all they think about. Well, Google is photos, Google is blogs, media, every newspaper, every article. Gmail, how many people here use Gmail? Every single person in the room, with a tiny number of exceptions, raised their hand. Do you know that your email is searched by bots? Of the people who raise their hand, how many of you know that your email is searched, indexed, and categorized? Okay, now, no, 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 leave your hands up. How many of you care? None of you. I'd, but now, now the same people, how many of you would be running out and hiring a lawyer if somebody was opening the mail at your mailbox reading it, pasting it back shut, and putting it back in the box. Every single one of you. Much worse, but you don't get it, or you don't care. And they read every single email. Google chat. Maps. Let me tell you, if you do a Google map search on 123 Main Street, they know Bob is interested in 123 Main Street. Everything that you do has significance. Google products, frugal they call it. If you look something up, again, your likes and your interests. Not only does Google know everything there is to know about you, but it knows where you are a good part of the time. It knows who you hang out with. 
every time that you log in, it buffers your IP address. Now, by the way, how many of you follow, are following this whole Viacom YouTube lawsuit? The most cynical, hypocritical thing I've ever seen is Google, for the past five years, telling me and you and everybody in the world, IP addresses aren't important. IP addresses don't tell you anything. And in the Viacom lawsuit, when Google gets hit with a subpoena for everybody who uses I YouTube's IP address, Google goes into court with an enormous, fat, 430-page brief detailing how IP addresses can be de-anonymized, which we're going to talk about, and indicate the exact person that used it. Most hypocritical legal brief ever written. Google on cell phones. Listen. <laughs> One of the things that iPhones are going to be doing is stripping away the last shred of privacy that you have. And we're going to talk about this. If you use a computer, if you're careful about static versus dynamic IP addresses, if you use Firefox and it wipes out your cache and your browsing history and all of that, you have some tiny sense of anonymity. Of course, until you log into somewhere, then you're screwed, of course. <laughs> With your cell phone, it's you. Google is already registered as a telecom, which means they get the full CNAM file. For those of you who are not at that sufficiently high nerd level, let me tell you a CNAM file is your subscriber data. Google gets it. So if they know that cell phone 212-555-1234 is checking on Google Maps for a certain address, or is scanning a barcode, or is looking up you know, doctors in Milwaukee, they know it's you. You can't hide if you do it on the cell phone. The cell phone is you. And that is the last shred of your anonymity. I mean, here's what's amazing is they put stuff up there that if I was their ad guy, I wouldn't want to let people realize this until it's too late. But here's what they put up there. When users snap a shot of a barcode, the app pulls up reviews and price computations from the web. Yes, I will know everything that you're interested in if you use that phone to snap a barcode and have it searched. They have something called Commandro, a GPS, a GPS enhanced social networking app that lets you map and track your friends in real time and them track you, of course. And here's, here's the last one, the creepiest one. To me, probably not to you, they have something called Cooking Capsules. Displays cooking videos and ingredient lists then uses the phone's location awareness to find the nearest grocery store. See, I find that creepy. You may just find it useful. <laughs> now, a little bit of honesty here. Just in case you're really careful when you browse, how many people here, careful, I'm going to use the word not, how many people here have not Googled their own name? Do you own a computer? One guy. You own a computer? All right, I'll talk to you about this later. You're security, watch this guy. <laughs> OK. How many people here, a show, a show of hands, how many people here have Googled their own address? Pretty much everybody. How many have Googled their own phone number? OK, almost everybody. Now. Think about this for a second. How many people here have Googled their own social security number? Lots of hands. Why? <laughs> but it's all linked together at that IP address. Trust me, they now know it's you. Now, when I first started giving this talk when Google was becoming big, I put this up here as a joke. You know, I said someday there's going to be a trial, and if you look back on the old DVDs, or probably far back enough their videos now, or war, you'll see that I put this up on the screen and I said, someday a guy's going to kill his wife and they're going to find in his Google browsing history, they're going to find poisons, divorce lawyers, Aruba, offshore banking, and life insurance, and they're going to convict him. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened last year. <laughs> There's a guy by the name of Justin Barber in Florida. Justin Barber 
calls 911, help, help, I've been shot. These criminals broke into my house, ski masks, you know, guns, they shot my wife, they shot me in the chest, help, send police, send an ambulance. The cops come, they think he's the victim. One smart detective says, hmm, looks in his cash, finds out that two months before the shooting, he had Googled, trauma cases, gunshot, right chest. Mr. Barber is now on death row in Florida, honestly. You can Google it. <laughs> now, again, you've got to really look at the totality of what Google does. And if you do, you will understand pretty quickly they want to suck out your brain and put it in a database. And among their recent activities have been to buy DoubleClick, which is basically every damn thing you do on the net. FeedBurner, what tells more about you than your RSS feeds? Honestly, if you have an RSS feed to a Nigerian newspaper, you're probably from Nigeria. If you have an RSS feed to a gay website, you're probably gay. If you have an RSS feed to the Jerusalem Post, you're interested in Israel. I said that because my buddy from the Jerusalem Post is here. Feed burner, perfect example. Google bought it. If you use Google Docs, if you go onto Google and you use them to compose your business documents and your personal letters and what have you, I mean, what else is left? Now, just in terms of creepiness, two things I want to mention, Google Health and 23andMe. Google Health, people are going to start using Google as the repository of your electronic medical records. That's pretty much it, guys. And 23andMe is mapping everyone's genome that comes in and says, I want it done privately. It's owned by Sergey Brin's wife and funded by Google. Google Friend Connect, everybody you know. Google Profile, just in case Google hasn't been able to build the most detailed, you know, J. Edgar Hoover wet dream profile about you, <laughs> they give you the opportunity to, to just fill in the blanks for them. <laughs> Google Health, now, this is pretty much the last thing I'm gonna say about Google, but I wanna leave you with a sense of Google's attitude towards who owns the data about you. Their attitude is, once it's in their database, it's not yours anymore, it's theirs. And I gotta tell you something, they're right. Once it's in their database, they own it. I wanna give you some examples of how they've responded to complaints, pretty legitimate complaints. Street View, book scans and copyrights, YouTube, the lawsuit by Viacom, and misuse of trademarks. This is one of my favorite Google stories. A guy by the name of Kevin Bankston, who unluckily for Google worked for the EFF. Kevin Bankston says, hey, I want to take a look at street view of my house. So he pulls it up, and it's a picture of him walking in front of his house. And he freaks out. And he calls Google, he says, you know, taking a picture of my house is one thing, but that's me, take it out of your database. And they essentially said, Mr. Bankston, bite me. Because he's from EFF, 8,000 lawyers parachuted into the situation. <laughs> and, and, and they took down his photo. And because it was their bad luck at that point to have set a precedent, God bless the EFF, they now blur the faces of everybody in Street View. And yes, I checked. Hotel Pennsylvania also. <laughs> but they had to have lawyers on their ass for months. Good example of their attitude. By the way, th uh, well, this is more for investigative seminars, but just in case you think Google does that, pretty much every tax assessor does this now also. This is a real case that I did where I was looking up a guy's house, the real property, and when I pulled up his house, not only did I get a picture of his house, but I saw there's no fence, the two cars, and that he has a big inquisitive dog which for an investigator is a useful thing to know. 
Let's talk about what's, what's, what's lovingly in the most Orwellian language possible called the Google Book Project. It's for your benefit. So if you want to research something, my goodness, every book is in their system. Yeah, there's this one problem. There's this thing called copyright, which they don't care about. And the greatest, the greatest quote was from a guy in the UK. UK people know how to be obnoxious. And he said, you know, I'm almost tempted to do this in a British accent, but I won't subject you to that. He says, he says, to endorse what Google is doing, scanning and copyrighted books, is to say it's okay to break into my house because you're going to clean my kitchen while you're there. <laughs> it's absolutely true. What they're doing is improper, and there's been a big war about that, and Google has essentially said, eh, tough. Whoop, what the hell? Okay, how do I undo that? Uh, press that, no, press that. One second. Okay. What I wanted to do is I wanted to go back. Well, it's not letting me. Uh... Oh, no. Okay. Thank you, brother nerd. Perfect example is misuse of trademarks. If you work for the Coca Cola company, and you bid the highest on Google for the ad word Pepsi, anytime somebody Googles colas or Pepsi, they will get a link to your site. Never mind that millions and millions of these things are trademarked and that there's been problems with Ford searches going to Nissan and Coke going to Pepsi and things like that. Google just doesn't care. And by the way, final word on their relative sense of humor. A CNET reporter, the online newspaper, decided to go in and, and interview the Google staff. And before they did, before, before this reporter, this intrepid reporter, went and interviewed the Google PIO guy, public information officer, he Googled him. And he went in with a big stack of stuff, and he said, halfway through the interview, he said, by the way, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about privacy concerns. You know, it's, it's now possible to pretty much know everything about someone, and there's probably even more stuff that you're not putting out on the net, which we now all know is true. Here, for example, is the stack of stuff I Googled on you. And if you read this article, which New York Times, uh, no, I'm sorry, Wall Street Journal, if you read this article or look up this story, probably not on Google, but if you look up this story, you'll see that what happened is this Google PIO guy jumped up, started screaming at the guy, threw him out of the office, and banned all interviews with CNET for a year. Sense of humor is lacking. Now, Yahoo, which is in some areas even bigger than Google. Most of us don't know that, but it is. At least they're upfront about it. Yahoo says, once you register with us and sign in, you're not anonymous. We're gathering your stuff. Microsoft, I mean, you all knew Microsoft was doing it without me telling you. <laughs> Let's talk for a second about de-anonymizing data. How many of you in this room, just show of hands, think that at least most of the time, or a substantial part of the time, you are anonymous on the net? How many of you think that? <laughs> See, this is an awesome crowd. <laughs> I, I, I don't know where the camera is. I can't tell where the, the video is being made from. But if it's not being made from in the back, nobody raised their hand. So this is the right crowd for me. University of Texas was able to take Netflix purchases and IMDB postings, check for proximity and time, and de-anonymize some of the people by saying, OK, this person checked on Netflix for Gone with the Wind. I'm making that up. 
And the next day, wrote a review on IMDb about Gone with the Wind. Anytime you have correlation of different points of data, you get closer and closer and closer to you. It's like <coughs> cell phone triangulation, but with data. Laura Sweeney, amazingly smart woman, took the 1990 census data, which by statute is, a, is, is all anonymous data for the next, I think it's 50 or 60 years. She was able to de-anonymize 87% of the census records just by the unique name, gender, age, zip code matches. You know, you may not be the only Bob Jones. You may not be the only 65-year-old guy in zip code 11229. But if I get enough data about you, the sample gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it's a sample of you. I mean, the example that I give when I do the law enforcement seminar is if you've got somebody, you get, you get a description of, of, a, of, a, of a bank robber, and you're told it's a six foot eight Chinese tap dancer in Ames, Iowa. There's probably only one. And that's, that's an example of de-anonymizing data. The more information that I can pull in, I don't care if I have your name, I don't care if I have your address, I don't care if I have your social security number or some ultimate identifying data, called identifier by the way. If I have enough unique data, I can figure out who you are. And my usual audiences are, you know, doubting investigators, so I have to give them RW stands for real world examples. Thelma Arnold, about three years ago, Congress went to all of the search engines and said, we want all your search info. And some people said no, some people went to court. AOL said, we're gonna, we'll give you all the search info, but we're going to anonymize each record. We're gonna take out the name, we're gonna take out whatever. So the New York Times, which pretty well sucks as a newspaper, but they do some good things, took these records and said, all right, we're going to take 100 random samples and see how anonymous is it really. And they found out in pretty short order and wrote an article about it. They found out in pretty short order that AOL searcher number 4,417,749 is Miss Thelma Arnold. And how did they find that out? Well, her search history included 60-year-old single men, landscapers in Lyburn, Georgia, the Shadow Lake subdivision, Arnold, and dog that urinates on everything. <laughs> and in pretty short order, they found somebody named Arnold who lived in the Shadow Lake subdivision in Lyburn, Georgia, and is around the age of 60 and single, and in fact, has a dog that urinates on everything. You are not anonymous on the web. And again, all of the little things that help us find out who you are, cookies, browsing history, downloading history, embedded graphics, which supposedly went the way of the dinosaur, but trust me, they're back. Micro pages, those little pages that stay there forever until you close your browser. That little page is allowing that little pages web creator to watch your cookie as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more informative. And then right before you log off, it sucks it down. Passwords, personal data, etc., cetera, in, in, in URL strings and URL strings. How many of you logged onto a website and been horrified to see that the URL that pops up has your email address in it and your password and your name and all of that? Well, all of that goes into the cookie. Okay, this is, this is the, real, the real nerd graduate exam. How many people in this room have heard of Nebuad or Form? Unbelievable. A lot of, lot of, lot of the room. Eh? And for those of you who don't know what it is, it's server-side monitoring. The ad companies that want to know everything there is to know about you, so they can sell you stuff, not because they're you know, sinister members of the chaos organization, but because they want your money, they want to sell you stuff that you're interested in, 
are now paying a lot of the big web server companies to let them monitor your packet traffic. Searcher number 43 is now navigating to a gay website. Let's sell him stuff that might be of interest to, interest to him as a gay person. And by the way, the greatest quote, again, God bless the EFF, this is analogous to AT&T listening into your phone calls all day in order to figure out what to sell you at dinner. It's really true. Cloud computing. How many people here store files offline or use stuff like Google Documents, honestly? Okay, do you not know that everything that you are reaching out and touching is now suddenly available to all of these intrusive people? Another great site. Now we're going to go into the sites that investigators use. Monster.com. Monster has 40 million people either looking for workers or looking for jobs. There's resumes up there, name, date of birth, address, educational history, training, background, earning history. <coughs> I can tell you when I do competitive intelligence on a company, one of the first places I go. Why? I find people who used to work for the company that I'm investigating, and I chat with them. They don't work there anymore, and they talk to me. Also, I see what type of positions the company's trying to fill, what type of problems they're having. Are they offering less for the same position now than they did a year ago? Enormous amount of information. People put their entire resumes up there. Zaba search. Zaba search is available. You know, most people laugh at this. They think it's crap. It's got Kevin Mitnick's every single address in there. And presumably, Kevin knows how to hide. You in the audience, Kevin? <laughs> well, we've got your address. This is the entire TransUnion credit database without the identifiers. Zoom Info, again, jobs. All of these sites and LinkedIn and, and, and all of the sites that you're constantly like me getting mail from your friends that want you to join their circle. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now. Finances, again, as an investigator, thank you. One of the hardest things to do is find your money so we can grab it when you owe a client money. So many of you, however, these days are considerate. And you go to Microsoft's money or the Quicken site, and you put things up there like, hi, I'm Bob from Flatbush. And I just inherited $100,000 from my dead aunt Gladys. And where should I put this money? And trust me, Bob, we know who you are. There are millions and millions of these posts. Who links to me, Google's links to, incredible aids. Now, <laughs> some stuff cracks me up. We've covered how considerate you are by putting your entire life up for public view. We've covered the publicly available sites that grab your data and amalgamate your data when you touch them in any way. If you're smart, if you're careful, it doesn't matter. Somebody else will put your stuff up there. There's, there's hundreds of these, but these two just cracked me up. Don'tdatehimgirl.com and whosarat.com. Here's Don't Date Him Girl. This, as you, might, as you might imagine, is reviews of dates that did not live up to the woman's highest expectations. Here is alleged cheater Aaron Carter III. His name, his age, his height, his weight, his city, state. And the note, this boy will use you like no other. He smokes weed all day, every day. And if he doesn't have it, he will freak out. Thank you. Very helpful if I'm checking them out. OK, here's the funniest one. <laughs> this is Jonathan John Rainwater from McDonough, Georgia. John, if you're in the audience, I'm really sorry for this. 
this man or so-called boy is such a liar. First he said that he loved me and we were together for four years. And then I catch him in bed with another guy. Now if that's not enough, I catch him in bed with another guy, comma, Devin Pridemore. <laughs> so we've got both their names. You know, thank you. Who's a rat? Now, as, as we all experienced two years ago, the FBI has very little sense of humor. So this guy's in jail. The guy who put up Who's a Rat is now locked up for eight years. I don't know if he was really selling pot. If he wasn't selling pot, he just got eight years for selling pot. The site is still up, however. This is a site of everybody who is known or accused of being a government informant their name, their picture, who they've ratted on, what they've done. Here's a sample. This is Thomas Evans, 32, from Massachusetts. Usually does his snitching in Danvers, Beverly, <laughs> Mattapon. He's white. He's a paid rat for the Massachusetts State Police and DEA. He's a drug use informant. There's his photo. Looks like a, I don't know, school book photo. Other rage sites. There's a lot of rage sites targeting individual people and in individual companies. You don't like T-Mobile? T-MobileSucks.com. You don't like this particular guy, John Grogan? TruthAboutGrogan.org. <laughs> Combine rage sites, the ripoff report. Anybody you've done business with you think has done you wrong, their name and company goes up there. Example. The stained glass people, Mark and Jay Shirley. Follow up to see if anyone has been able to locate or recently come across Mark and Jay Shirley, the stained glass people. I had a whole story about how they took money for a job that they didn't do. Now, one in 10 people in America now have, probably one in 100, 100 and 100 people in this room have personal blogs, but across America now, one in 10 people have personal blogs. And they write about their friends, and they write about their family, and they have no stop button. They write about everything. Here's a woman going through an ugly divorce and decided to blog about it. And by the way, not only did she blog about it, she put up a whole YouTube video, and she posts to YouTube every few days. Uh, here's an example of what she put up on the blog. She says, we never had sex. He said it was because he had high blood pressure. I accepted that. Then, last year I found Viagra, porn movies, and condoms. Maybe I should call him up and ask him what he wants to do with the condoms. Okay, mind-boggling to me that people write about this stuff on the net. I'm old school, but this is the new reality. Even newspapers, even supposedly reputable newspapers, you get arrested for anything, they put your name, the arrest, and the photo up on their website. I mean, they're, they're really considerate. They put next to the photo, so-and-so was charged with DWI. The gallery represents the charge at the time of the photo. Newsday will not be updating the status of these cases. All are presumed innocent unless proven guilty. Gee, thanks, Newsday. <laughs> this is up there forever. And if Newsday decides to take it down, it's in the Wayback Machine, it's in archive.org, it's, you know, cached somewhere. Even if this guy was mistakenly arrested for the rest of his life, there you go. Oh, I shouldn't zip past this. This guy's mother was dating somebody, and this 14-year-old kid thought that the guy was kind of a bad guy, so he got together I guess the little rascals with video cameras following the guy around, and they caught him messing around with a girl, videoed the whole thing, and then put it up on the net with a whole narrative scrolling across the bottom and little, little arrows saying who it is with a little note under the other woman, the mistress. You know, frankly, the most dangerous thing is a 14-year-old guy with a video camera. <laughs> now, not so public stuff, but stuff that investigators and, and other people looking at you use every day. The appropriately named MIB, the Medical Information Bureau, 
Every time you apply for insurance, every time you make a claim, every time you have a medical test, all your HMO stuff, in there or in ISO, there's two. How many of you have gone to a bar and they say, let me see your ID, and then they put it through a scanner or they put it under a camera and whatever? Pretty much everybody. Well, you should know that that does not only stay with the bar, it goes into a big database, 17 million new, not 17 million, 17 million new records a year get added. Even from states where driving records are closed due to privacy, thank you very much, you've just given it to a new database. Now, <laughs> Rambam's first law of data use. All data will eventually be used for some unintended purpose. Perfect example, Domino's Pizza. How is it that when you dial 1-800-crappy-pizza or whatever their number is, <laughs> they are able to route that call to the Domino's next door to you, even though it's probably ringing in Nebraska in a prison somewhere or something. <laughs> it ring, the, the person who answers it is your local Domino's and he says, hi Bob, what would you like to order today? The answer is they have access to the CNAM data they have access to your previous purchasing history. They have access to a whole host of databases. And they built the biggest customer database in America. Bigger than Walmarts, bigger than Sears, bigger than the car companies. This is the biggest consumer database in America. And let's say you're trying to hide from your ex-wife. Let's say you're trying to hide from the cops. You never think to hide from Domino's. Yeah, this is Bob Jones. I'm at 123 Main Street. Yeah, I'm the guy who always orders, you know, the extra pineapple, double deep dish. Yeah, okay, bring a couple of bottles of soda, see you in 20 minutes. U.S. Marshal Service bought this database, so help me God. This database is now being used to track down felons, so if any of you are wanted, and you've recently ordered Domino's Pizza, move. <laughs> Who else has bought pizza databases? NYPD, U.S. Marshal Service, collection agencies, credit bureaus buy it up. By the way, I'm going to start going through this a little bit like a speed freak, because in 45 minutes we're going to do the Q&A, which is always the best part of the talk, and I want to leave a full hour for that. <clears throat> Points of purchase. Every time you use a credit card, every time you use an affinity card, Every time you use a frequent purchaser card, it goes into that great database. Why? People want to know you buy pork rinds. People want to know you buy five, six packs of beer a week. There's stuff they can sell you, you lush. You know, <laughs> like, like AA mailings. Now, it sounds like a joke. Remember Rambam's first law of unintended data use. Or unanticipated data use. Stop and shop, or stop and rob as we used to call it. The supermarket chain decided, hey, we've got all these stop and shop affinity purchasers who we know everything they buy and everything they like. And guess what? We know if they eat salty food. We know if they buy a lot of booze. We know if they buy the extra fatty bacon. We're going to sell this to the local HMOs. And the HMOs are going to be able to use it to do underwriting on your premiums. Is it likely this guy is going to stroke out or fall drunk in front of a bus, and we're going to have to give him more medical care? This is good for us to know. So they started a program called, obnoxiously called, Smart Mouth. Now, by the way, the uproar in Boston was so great, so enormous, that they even had local assembly hearings about it. Stop and Shop said, okay, okay, we changed our mind, we won't do it. Perfect example, though, of what's possible. Investigators, holy grail number two. Now it gets scary. Trackers. First thing I want is your photo, so I know it's you when I find you. Second thing I want to do, as soon as I get that photo, is find you. 
Let's talk about all the ways that I can tell where you are at this moment or where you are at any given moment in time. Well, you use Microsoft, any Microsoft program, you boot up the laptop, you start up the computer, it phones home. Apple, same thing. Windows Media Player, same thing. Anytime you log into anything, same thing. It tells me exactly where you're connected. Representative implementations of this. AOL now has a plug-in that allows anybody on your buddy list, if you both have the plug-in, to find you and you can find them based on the Skyhook system, which we're going to talk about, based on the mapping of every single node in America. How many people here decided to be wonderful, generous humanitarians and buy that one laptop per child? A lot of people. Well, guess what? There's something on that called Bitfrost that calls into the one lap per child server every single day and you can't disable it. Trade it in, sell it on eBay. Internet Explorer. Anytime you have activated software and it's phoning home. Even we, we calls in, here's an example of what it reports every time you log in. Obviously who you are, the node you're calling in from, what games you played, the date, the time, the screen position, the widescreen settings, TV resolution, screen burn-in reduction, whether it's on or off, whether you're using stereo, and, and I mean, it, it goes all the way down. Everything reports on you. OnStar. OnStar can be turned on remotely with a warrant, and it's been done thousands of times. Easy Pass, iPass, SunPass, obviously. Metro cards. If you buy a Metro card with your credit card, I know where Bob is at every moment he travels on the subway and swipes that card. Passenger lists, car chips, digital license plate readers. This is the new technology. Hundreds of thousands, no exaggeration, hundreds of thousands of cameras are being deployed around the country, and you're going to see a video of this in a second and in patrol cars. Patrol cars that at 60 miles an hour can still capture license plates at the rate of 3,000 an hour. Anytime your car is anywhere or moving anywhere, it's in a database. Unique serial numbers. Every single piece of hardware. Forget about MAC addresses. We all know about MAC addresses. Every time you burn a CD or a DVD, unique serial number embedded in that. Every time you take a picture with a camera, and we're going to be talking about that in a second, there's an EXIF tag that identifies you. New satellites coming online. You have your cell phone. It's GPS enabled. In two years, I'm going to be able to know within six inches where you are. Let's talk about cell phones. Cell phones are the most significant development, bar none. We're going to talk a little bit about cameras. We're going to talk a little bit more about, about intensely targeted marketing. But this is the number one issue. That cell phone can be immediately traced to you. That cell phone is with you 24-7. I know where you are. I know who you're hanging out with. I know how long you're there. I know Bob went over to Susan's house, stayed for three hours, left, got on the subway, got off the subway at this location, had a slice of pizza, went home, went to sleep without tailing you. I know that from your cell phone. I know, you know, it sounds like Santa Claus. I know when you're sleeping. I know when you're awake. I know who you're hanging out with, so I know if you've been bad or good. It's really that significant. Because of Skyhook, because of GPS, because of databases like Navtech that tell me if you're at such and such GPS coordinates, that's Tammy's Boom Boom Room. If you're at such and such coordinates, it's a bar, it's a car rental agency, it's a motel. I know where you are, and I know what's there. Every single cell phone company, they're not trying to hide this. They're selling this as an add-on. Track your kids. Track your friends. Use it to identify your current location. 
But tracking goes in two directions. MapQuest, even MapQuest is using it. MoloGoGo, they're trying to get you to put a download on your phone. This, by the way, is probably the most patronized company by investigators because there's a, where is it? That cell phone there, they sell you an anonymous cell phone with GPS tracking with everything already activated and prepaid. You can stick this in an otter box under somebody's car, track their car 24 seven. And if they find it and they go, hey, there's a tracker here, you're not gonna know whose tracker it is. So if you find that under your car, you know why. The new iPhone. The new iPhone is the trend of the future. Everybody is going to have an intensely location-aware cell phone. Okay, just out of curiosity, show of hands real quick. How many people here know what Skyhook is? Outstanding, at least half of you. For those of you who don't, 500 people spent five years going around essentially war driving for money, recording MAC addresses and locations. This is supplemental now on every enabled cell phone. Not only do I have your GPS, but it tells me, okay, that cell phone's Wi-Fi is 100 feet to the south of a MAC address that I know is at 123 Main Street. So even if you're in a canyon in Manhattan, I know where you are from Wi-Fi. Uh, the stats are 55 million Wi-Fi nodes and hotspots mapped. 55 million, 75% of the U.S. And if you want to get into that whole Terminator Skynet frame of mind, this system is self-healing. Let's say they know about a router or a MAC address that's been in Chicago. And all of a sudden, in three weeks, a cell phone that they know is in New York because of five other nodes, picks up that previously in Chicago MAC address in New York, the system knows to go, the system is smart enough to say to itself, aha, uh -huh, Bob took his router and now he's living in New York. And it self-corrects. And it will keep growing and growing and growing. The cell phone detects a new Wi-Fi node, a new MAC address, it knows from four other nodes where that is. It records that new node. The iPhone, which probably everybody in this room is going to ultimately own or some version thereof, uses both GPS and Skyhook. You can't hide. Now, let me just say, the only way to hide from this, to keep me from knowing where you are at every moment, is to take out the battery. Oh, wait a second, you can't take the battery out of an iPhone. <laughs> oh, well. Now, it's not enough that I know where you are. I also know what's there. There are databases that map every single location. At this GPS coordinate is 123 Main Street, and we know from business records that 123 Main Street is Bob's Bar and Grill. So we know from... Hector's cell phone GPS location, he spent the past four hours at the bar and grill. And this is, I mean, very openly marketed. I want to give you an example. I want to talk to you about something. This is a system that's actually being developed by a really close friend of mine named Gabby in Israel. Uh, it's called Rabbi. Rabbi stands R-A-B-B-I, R-A-A-B-I stands for Relationship and Activity Analysis and Behavior Informant. What does it mean? It means the cell phone in your pocket is ratting you out 24-7. That phone tells me where you are, when you're there, when you're awake, when you're in motion, and by checking other cell phones, who you're hanging out with. Here's an example. Now, by the way, why is it Italian mafia people? For those of you that are Italian, I'm part Italian, I'm sorry. I don't mean to discriminate against you, but the Gambino family does not have an anti-defamation league, and so we're using them. 
I want you to imagine this is all from cell phones. And this, by the way, is a half hour conversation when I'm speaking to law enforcement groups. Because this is the new trend of law enforcement, remote monitoring of people without making them put on that Martha Stewart bracelet. You know at 3 p.m., Vinny and Cheech separately, and you know because their cell phones are separate, arrive, and you'll excuse the, the lasagna joke, at Don Vito Lasagna Social Club. Fifteen minutes later, Don Vito arrives. Immediately following Don Vito's arrival, three guys in there, Eddie the Hook, Tommy One-Eye, and Bobby the Butcher, depart the social club. And they're shown for the next 45 minutes within 100 feet of the router and Spanky's Boom Boom Lounge. Okay, I'm not going to go through the whole thing I normally go through with law enforcement groups. What happened? Don Vito came in, said, you three guys get out of here, I got to talk to these people. Those three guys go down the block, they hang out in the bar. At 4 o'clock, Eddie and Tommy and Bobby return to the club, Vinny and Cheech leave. Conversation's over, Don Vito told them what they need to know. 2.25 in the morning, those two guys who've been briefed by Don Vito meet Eduardo the Mule on the docks. And we know that because we're tracing his SIM card. Two days later, in all of Don Vito's territory, there's an influx of a new type of Colombian cocaine. Okay, gee, what does this mean? It means they met with a Colombian cocaine connection, he gave them a trunk of stuff, now they're moving it. All of this without surveillance, without informants, just from cell phones, Wi-Fi and common sense. This is the future of monitoring of you. This is an artificial intelligence program which I have seen work and is already being implemented by two na so-called national law enforcement organizations. Trust me. What I'm about to say, I'm saying because it's true, not because I don't like the FBI, and I don't like the FBI, but this happens to be true. The FBI is a genuinely inept bunch of guys as far as, you know, in the field investigation. And they try to resolve that by doing things like huge rewards, huge payments to informants, uh, technical means, forming task forces where you've got a guy in his wingtip shoes working with two NYPD cops who really know how to go out and hit the bricks. They, they try to remedy it. But they're huge. They spend a fortune on technical means for surveillance and investigation. I guarantee you that this AI program or something very, very similar will be, be, will be implemented, at least beta testing, in the US within the next six months. Guaranteed. I give you my personal guarantee. Try to collect if I'm wrong, but I give you my personal guarantee. And by the way, most likely, it's not going to be Don Vito and Joey the Hook. It's going to be Ahmed and Mohammed spent an hour in Sammy's shawarma shop. I'm going to show you something in a couple of minutes as far as monitoring. Let me tell you, I'm a New Yorker, and I've lived in Israel. So I've seen the worst of terrorism that there is. And yes, terrorism is an Islamic phenomenon more than not. But even I'm horrified by the way people are being targeted because of their religion. And I'm going to give you an example in a second. So all of these technical means, I've got to tell you, they're going to be targeted at people who make the government nervous, who make the government concerned, who the government can't pigeonhole, like maybe hackers. Let me give you two real-world examples of cell phones for investigation. Center for Complex Network Research, Northeastern University in Boston, they went to the phone companies and they said, give us location activity for 100,000 cell phone users. And the telephone company said, yeah, okay, here you go. They were able to develop from proximity to cell sites and triangulation 
where those 100,000 people were over the space of a year, and they developed really, really detailed you know, population migration patterns and what people do on an average day. By the way, both of us, most of us, we don't go far from home. We're boring. We eat in the neighborhood. I, I mean, I could have told you that without a $5 million study, but nevertheless. Second one, second example, is a really good example of what I'm talking about. The CIA sent a team of approximately 30 agents to Italy, to Milan, to snatch a guy. Now, probably they snatched him just because of his name, which was Hassan Mustafa Osama Nasser. But ostensibly, they snatched him because he was involved in Al-Qaeda and setting up a local cell. And they did what these days is euphemistically called an extraordinary rendition, which means they threw him on a plane and they shipped him to a country where they do have open torture. And this guy was tortured and beaten and all the good stuff that happens. And then the CIA packed up their cloaks and daggers and left. Well, it came to the attention of the Italian police that some people appeared and kidnapped one of their citizens, one of their naturalized citizens. And because the Italians care more about their citizens than we do in America, they said, we're going to investigate. And they investigated. And there is now a trial of 26 CIA agents in abstentia for this kidnapping. Now, how did they figure out who's who and what's what? First of all, they checked when this guy was swooped up on the street, what cell phones were there. Aha. Five of them were American cell phones. Wait, five American cell phones with consecutive numbers. Geniuses. You know, <laughs> when, I watch, when I watch James Bond, and they have Q, and Q gives them like the exploding fountain pen and the revolving license plates, I like to think that the people protecting my life and liberty have access to the same thing. Instead of Q, they went to T-Mobile. <laughs> no, really. They said, we need 30 GSM cell phones prepaid. And probably some guy picking his nose behind the counter said, OK, uh, will this be cash or charge? Yeah, here's my CIA credit card. <laughs> By the way, not much of an exaggeration. They all had consecutive MasterCard numbers, too. This is not a joke. These people were traced to their hotels. The other 21 people that they were working with were discovered by cell phone proximity by the fact that 24 of the 26 cell phone numbers were consecutive. I mean, it's, it, first of all, just letting you know how easy it is. Second of all, sort of cringing in front of you about the state of my colleague's conduct. Bottom line, anywhere you are with a cell phone, anything you do, anybody that you're with, your activity patterns, your likes, your dislikes, where you are on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you're awake, whether you're asleep, who you talk to on the phone, so on and so on and so on, your cell phone is ratting you out. New future. Why? Not because people really want to give you a digital proctology exam. People want to sell you stuff. Bob eats a lot of Chinese food. We know that from his MasterCard. It's 12.30. Bob is in motion. The location of his cell phone is two blocks away from a Chinese restaurant that advertises with us. Text message on Bob's cell phone. Hey, Bob, hungry? Eating lunch yet? Wing, Wing Bing Bong's restaurant, two blocks down and to the left. You know what? If I was Bob, I'd say, hey, this is pissing me off. And yeah, Chinese sounds good. <laughs> It's really a good marketing technique. Where do you spend your time, your activities? Now, by the way, this stuff is so accurate that there's a company in Israel developing something called M-Confirm. Bob is using his credit card in Milwaukee. Bob's not from Milwaukee. Bob's from Cleveland. I don't know. Why is Bob using his credit card in Milwaukee? Oh, it's OK. Bob's cell phone is right there where his credit card is being used. Confirm the transaction, let it go through. Or alternately, 
Bob's cell phone is in Cleveland, his credit card is in Milwaukee, deny the charge. Real world examples. If you are convicted of DWI in Riverside County, California, your bracelet and your cell phone are constantly tracked. Are you going near a bar? Are you going near a car rental agency? If you do, a text message gets sent to your parole officer. Dallas County, if you are a habitual truant, you have to carry a GPS locator beacon or you have to register your GPS cell phone with Dallas County School Authorities. And by the way, I don't know how well you can see this, but these are little people. And then there's an icon of a guy in like a detective's hat and whatever. That's, that's where the truant officer is. <laughs> I mean, this is a pretty funny thing, but it really works. And if, and, if little, and if little Jimmy, who's been missing school all week, is not at school and they check his beacon, and he's at the, uh, at the uh, well, let's hope he's at the Internet Cafe, but he's probably not. You know, wherever he is, the, the, little, the little slouch hat, you're going to see it move closer on the map to where he is. Just one little creepy thing. This is a real screenshot from an iPhone. Google would like to use your current location. Welcome to the new world. Oh yeah, final, final word. Another prediction from, from the Swami Steve. I guarantee you that within a few months, we will see divorces caused by people's cell phone locators going blank. Bob's working late. For three hours, Bob's wife can't find his cell phone. When Bob comes home, there's a divorce lawyer on the porch. Guaranteed. This stuff I'm going to zip through, but I just want you to be aware of it. TV, TiVo, cable. Again, a window into your soul. What do you watch? When do you watch it? When are you home? How much time do you spend at home, frankly? What type of things do you like to watch on TV? It hasn't made the newspapers, but it's made ad magazines. TiVo is selling all your data and all your watching history. Money. Money is one of the best ways to track you, mainly because the government is nervous about you and money. So they've mandated as much tracking as they can. There's now something called the 21st Century Act, which has been implemented. When you deposit a check, it clears instantly. They scan it right through that little spinning machine. The information goes to your bank before you're out the door of where you deposited it. Credit cards. Everything is going towards a cashless society. And all of this is tracked and put into databases. By the way, you open a new bank account, that bank runs you through an Experian database. It's no longer just a government database that lists all of the bank accounts and all of the banking relationships. It's in private databases now also. Now we're going to move on to target marketing and intensely targeted marketing, meaning you're the target. People want to sell you stuff. This is not, by definition, a sinister thing. This is one of the big engines of capitalism. I want to know what you like and what you might buy for two reasons. Number one, so I can sell it to you. And number two, so I don't waste all my budget and all my time and piss off millions of people by sending them ads for widgets they may not want or need. I want to know the 4,000 people in this country who are interested in my book, who are interested in my car, whatever. And the technology and the databases to determine who you are, what you like, the deepest, most intimate things about you has grown so enormously that it's now able to finally define things down, not just to a group of people, but to you. Every time you subscribe to something, every time you call a toll-free number, every product survey or product registration you put in, every time you do a survey on the net, Every credit card purchase, every affinity purchase, it all goes into this massive 
marketing conglomeration. Your likes, your dislikes, your habits, your religion, your politics, your sexual orientation. This is what I used to talk about six years ago, before everything was, or eight years ago, before everything was sucked into databases. These are magazines. Let's think about what subscribing to these magazines says about you. If you subscribe to strategy in business or revenue, you've got financial interests. Game Informer, Game Pro, you're a gamer. Ecologist, Home Power, you're interested in green issues. Wine Spectator, you buy wine, duh, right? Bark, Cat Fancy or Dog Fancy, Horse, Animal Fair, you own the appropriate animal. Skateboarding, skiing, golf, again, ditto. Gun Digest, you own a gun. <laughs> Football, this is a two for one. You're interested in soccer and you come from a Hispanic background. Two things I want to know about you. No, seriously, that's how it works. Hebe, you're a member of the tribe. Psycho, that's a, real, that's a real magazine, the stupidest freaking name, but it's a real magazine. Psychotherapy. Now, it says something about you if you're a psychotherapist and if you're not a psychotherapist. There are magazines called Paranoia, UFO, MAD. Well, I subscribe to MAD. Cracked. There's a magazine called Paz. Paz is a magazine for HIV positive people. You may not want people to know that, but the minute you subscribe, I know that either you are HIV positive or somebody you care about is. Here's an example of marketing lists. Caught in a pickle. Here's 500,000 people who owe more money than they can ever pay back. Credit Amigos, really demeaning name, but it's the subset of the one above, but they're Hispanic. Desperately seeking products, domain registration at home. I bought that entire database. We used to do a lot of work comp investigations. People would go, oh, my back, I can't work, pay me. And then we find out they register three domains at home, and they're making about $15,000 from, you know, their wheelchair. No wheelchair, but you know what I mean. Investors, outdoorsmen. Some of these really say not nice things about you. Every time I give this seminar, I put this up to let you know how ridiculously finely defined these lists are. This is called astrology success. This is the idiot database. <laughs> if, if you think I'm being cruel, let me read the description of this. Astrology success customers have responded to a direct mail solicitation offering angelic intervention for a fee. Give me $100, I'll have the Archangel Gabriel pray for your bunions. <laughs> Here are two, now by the way, Info USA, if you guys are really interested in this topic that we're talking about, check out Info USA. This is the stealth privacy invader. I, I mean, this guy, Vin Gupta, that started this, this company, I'm sure he takes off his hair and there's horns under there. Suffering seniors, elderly people with cancer, oldies but goodies, half a million gamblers over the age of 55. It's like, hey, pops, want to buy a lottery ticket? <laughs> if I want to know if you are gay and I want to discriminate against you or I want to set you up with my gay brother or whatever, for whatever reason I want to know, I can determine it without following you around and seeing if you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Do you go to gay websites? Do you go and participate in certain types of events like gay cruises? Have you done something online that I can extrapolate out to determine that you're gay? Chances are I can. I want to know your religion. Are you Christian? Are you Jewish? Are you Muslim? I can find out from databases. Are you right wing? Are you left wing? Even easier. Here's some two real world examples. These are two cases from about eight years ago. I've talked about this to this group before and I'll update it for you. These are real honest to God examples. Let's look at the first guy. 
we determine he's a subscriber to Soldier of Fortune magazine, American Rifleman, meaning he's an NRA member, Washington Times, Purchase the Force of Reason, he's a registered Republican, and he's listed in Focus USA, which is a big marketing outfit, Focus USA's Christian donors list. How hard is it to figure out this guy's most basic intimate character? He's a right-wing Christian gun-owning Republican. Duh, right? <laughs> yeah, but pretty accurately. And shut up. Second, 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 second person. These are real honest-to-goodness cases when we were backgrounding jury members or jury pool people. Subscribe it to the Village Voice. Woo. Subscribe it to the Village Voice, High Times Magazine, Cat Fancier, purchase Chomsky's latest book. He's registered, this is a real guy, registered with the Green Party, contributed to United Jewish Appeal, Gay Men's Health Crisis, and American Friends of Peace Now. This guy is a very left-wing, pot-smoking, Jewish homosexual. Now, as I always tell people, and some of you have heard this before, I always tell people, we know he's gay, not because of the gay men's health crisis, but because he's a guy who lives alone with a cat. <laughs> Here is the updated version. And this is for real. It really is this easy. We did this to Rick. And you're going to see that very quickly. Well, some of this refers to you. The part, not the gay part. I, I won't tell anybody. OK, he downloads podcasts from Air America. He reads daily costs, online search of voter registration records, which we even have in our office. Determines, determines that he's a, a registered Democrat, who he contributes to, his Amazon.com purchases. He subscribes to a gay travel blog. Yeah, there's really such a thing. Yeah, once. Yeah, but there's nothing, you know. What's wrong with that? What's, what's the Seinfeld line? That oh, doesn't matter. Yeah, not that there's anything wrong with that. And, and, he, and he's checked out the website Catster. Now, by the way, sadly, that's a real website. <laughs> Looking at that browsing history and viewing history and subscribing history, how hard is it to figure out what Rick, I mean, what our, you know, unknown person? Uh, it is possible. Now, here's where it gets spooky. This is something I would like to spend three hours on by itself, because this is one of the coolest, most interesting privacy invading technologies out there and one of the greatest things for investigators. It is possible to extrapolate out from two widely, widely divergent pieces of information to something you would never imagine. Here's an example. The first one, you know, the Germans are great at, you know, we must know about this man. When they started remarketing, sorry, Chaos Computer Club people, if you're an American, especially if you're a Jewish American, you've got to do that joke. So, but this is a true story. When Volkswagen reintroduced the Beetle about, I think it was 12 years ago, 14 years ago, they were trying to figure out who might own a Beetle. And the, the space between the original Beetles and the reintroduction of the new Beetles was so distant that they were having a hard time finding you know, old registration records. All of the normal marketing things were proving to be difficult. You can't walk down the street, you know, want to buy a car, want to buy a car? They needed to figure it out. And somehow, again, German technology, they figured out if you own a cat and you eat chunky peanut butter, you are three times as likely to buy a Volkswagen Beetle. OK, God bless them. How they would have even thought to combine these things or look at this, nobody knows. I, actually, I do know. What they did was the people who bought the Beatles, the, the Volkswagen Beatles, they gave them proctology exams. Please fill out this 900-page questionnaire. Would you, would you do that for us? And they found certain characteristics. And once they identified those common characteristics or those 
more prevalent characteristics, they started match marketing to people who matched those characteristics. And by the way, this is good business, good capitalism. I see nothing wrong with it, but it's scary. Who does this more than anybody? Political candidates. It started with Karl Rove, who had something called Roveology. Rove figured out, for example, if you drink bourbon, you are disproportionately more likely to vote Republican. If you drink, okay. <laughs> Apparently, Karl Rove is at the talk today. <laughs> if, you, if you drink clear alcoholic products, white wine, wussy, <laughs> vodka, gin, anything like that, you are more likely to vote Democrat. Here's an example of the stupid thing. I mean, marketers want to know everything about you. They know, for example, the average American has nine friends, drinks milk from the cereal bowl, eats 25 pounds of candy a year, wow, has lost 12 teeth by age 50 because of the 25 pounds of candy, <laughs> and prefers smooth peanut butter over chunky. They know that if you live in a certain neighborhood, even if you live in a wildly red state, certain neighborhoods are mostly blue state voting people. They've def Okay, let, let me just say, all kidding aside, not joking now, cut it out. If, for example, you like, that should say butter, by the way. If you like butter, white wine, Fig Newtons, fruit-filled cookies, Red Lobster, the, the, the restaurant, you drive a Volvo and you take yoga, you are disproportionately inclined, or you were, she's history now, to vote for Hillary. Olive oil, bare naked granola, granola going to Starbucks for lattes to go, Cheesecake Factory, Panera, and Starbucks, Barack Obama. Bourbon, stuffed crust pizza, fiber one, which is kind of funny. <laughs> but it's true. Hardee's, Fuddruckers, drive a BMW and you own a gun, you're a McCain man. All true in my case except for the fiber one. Now, what I told you about the Volkswagen bug, Jetta is trying to do it again. If you go to the Jetta website, they ask you to fill out something called the Jetta Report Questionnaire. Questions like, is lunch more important than breakfast or dinner? Would you like to start up your own business? Uh, is the first place you go for information the internet? Questions that have not the slightest thing to do with a car, but they have a lot to do with you and who they're going to need to market to. Now, beyond the marketers, beyond the cell phone people, there are people who do exist to build investigative databases on you. And if you are a law enforcement officer or you're part of the investigative industry, you know that these companies have been eaten up and eaten up and eaten up, and it's become a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger company. For example, when I started out, there was a company called IRSC, which got bought up by DBT, which got bought up by AutoTrack, which got bought up by CDB, which eventually became ChoicePoint which has now been bought up by LexisNexis, who first purchased Acura. And all of these companies had their own little, not so little actually, billions and billions of records on you. And all of this is now being merged into the most extraordinary database. Where you live, where you work, how much money you make, all the marketing stuff, what you buy, what you like, what you listen to your religion, your sexual orientation, your driver's license, criminal records. Every public record possible is being bought and sucked up. Why? In this particular case, because they really want to build an investigative database on you, but because it's worth money. Who is the biggest customer by far of this now megalopolis of data? The U.S. government. When they do a security check on you, you're going to get a, a security clearance, secret, top secret. First thing, pull a SISINT report. Are you a potential witness in a case? Are you a suspect? Pull a SISINT report. Every single thing now is being outsourced. 
And this is the main thing that's being outsourced. And besides the fact that there's just something inherently wrong and un-American in that, what you need to know is these are private companies. Freedom of information does not apply. And you're screwed two ways. You go to Choice Point and you say, what's in your files about me? None of your business. It's our business records, tough. You go to the government and you say, here's my Freedom of Information Act request. I know you pulled a Choice Point report on me. I want to know what was in that report. Sorry, we can't give it to you. It's a private business record. FOIA is dead, buried, tried to come back to life. Choice Point hammered a big stake in its heart, and now it's gone. These are, for a longer seminar, these are the companies they've bought. Now, Rick and I were talking about this earlier. This is a real case I did about two months ago. Guy came to me and he says, look, I don't want you to think I'm one of these repressed memory idiots, but I was, I was raped by my teacher 20 years ago. I'm not looking to bring charges. I'm not looking to sue him, but I want to hire you guys to investigate him, find out what he's doing now, and keep him from doing it to anybody else. I've come into a lot of money. We'll pay you. I said, absolutely, happy to do it. And I investigated the guy, who, by the way, is now just not a teacher. He's an assistant principal. And everything that I've talked about, when I background you, I do all of that stuff and more. And one of the things that I've been doing the past year is looking at these massive role player games. If I look at your avatar, if I look at what you do in Second Life, if I look at what you do in World of Warcraft or any of these other games, how much of a window into your true character is that? It's enormous. If you are an assistant, bald, fat, cigar smoking, high school principal, assistant high school principal, and this is your avatar, which it was, <laughs> no, which it really was, Man, you know, I kind of know I'm on the right track. <laughs> and by the way, flipping back to Google for a second, Google is now starting their own avatar chat room, find out about you that way because we are evil and we do do a lot of evil, called Lively. Now, the one thing you got to say about Google, when they screw you, they say, we are about to screw you. <laughs> Here's what they say on their official blog. I mean, who knew? Google has an official blog. If you enter a lively room embedded on your favorite blog or website, and by the way, you don't need special software. That's one of the things that sucks you in. You can do it from any browser. <clears throat> you can immediately get a sense of the room creator's interests. You can express your own personality. Yeah? You can express your own personality by customizing your avatar's look, showing, it's in red for a reason, showing people who you are without having to say a word. Now let's say I'm Mr. Google. I'm Sergey Brin. And I rise from my coffin. <laughs> and I go down to the data room. And I say, you know, we know everything about, what's your name? Okay. Put that in. Okay, <laughs> we know everything about Eleanor. We know where she lives. We know where she works. We've got her RSS feeds. We know what she downloads. We've got all the groups she contributes to. We've tracked her address. We've tracked her email address to where she contributes. But we want to know more. Tap, tap, tap. Go into Lively. Ah, she's using avatar number 703 the teenage sadomasochistic prostitute. It's a joke. But that really is how it's going to work. Each of these avatars, if you look at the embedded code, have a number, have a code number. When Mr. Assistant Principal uses this avatar, man, Google knows something's up. Again. You got to look a little behind <laughs> what's visible. Now, very near future.
five minutes behind schedule. Very near future will bring. I have been putting this up since 1998, so hope two. Uh, hope two, hope one, whatever. Whatever hope that was, I put it up. And this was a predictive graph. In fact, and by the way, this is right here. This is Brian Park. In fact, this was wildly underestimating. They estimated about 1,200 cameras a square mile. Manhattan now has a density of a minimum of 3,000 cameras a square mile below 96 all the way down to the battery. The average person walking around in Manhattan is caught on camera, I mean in this hotel every nanosecond, but <laughs> caught on camera walking in the street estimated 140 times a day. Now, it's not just cameras. If it was cameras, somebody would have to sit there and watch the cameras and know it's you and say, hey, that's Bob. Bob's walking down the street. Uh -uh. The technology has kept up with the cameras and with the installation. And you now have smart cameras, which have embedded, embedded facial recognition and embedded activity recognition. Facial recognition means the camera looks at you and it knows it's Bob. And it reports it's Bob, especially if somebody's looking for Bob. There's also activity, well, you know what? Let me do this in order. Here's representative growth. London. London, England in 1967, cameras were introduced. In 1996, about 20 years later, there were only 500 cameras. As of last year, there are 4.2 million, and you know, the Brits really know how to, how to put lipstick on a pig. They really do. <laughs> they call these cameras community safety cameras, not we're watching you every second of your life cameras. But that's what it is. Now, by the way, these cameras are worthless. They didn't stop the London tube bombing. As you'll see in a second, 50% of all assaults are caught on cameras in London. Only 3% of the crimes are solved as a result of the cameras. Now, if there isn't already a camera, every little police department. I've got a summer home down in the middle of nowhere in Texas. If I told you where it is, you've never heard of it. My nearest neighbor's a mile and a quarter away. The sheriff's department in my county has a drone. This is the new thing. Texas has them. Helicopter drones. This is Miami. Oh, this is actually my favorite one. Florida, before they really learned how to use the drone, it flew off and sunk in the ocean. <laughs> DARPA. DARPA, who brought you the internet? is making tiny, tiny, tiny little drones the size of flies. But here's the creepiest thing. They took a real moth, and they put like a little brain controller in it. This is an actual photo from DARPA, if you think I'm making this up. And they called it Cyborg Fly. They wanted to be able to have like this moth go into a room and fill you. It's like, yeah, Vinny, the shipment's coming in tonight. What's with these flies, you know? <laughs> I had to do that. But that's not that, that, I mean, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, not so wild. Oh, this is another spooky, spooky, spooky thing. Defense Research Associates, Devil Ray. This thing, if you look in the back, you'll see two spools. This thing, when it starts running low on power, like a vampire, it can let out two wires, fly on top of a, a, a high tension wire, suck up some power, recharge, suck up the spools, and fly on. I mean, this is the future. This thing will never land until the motor breaks or the Terminator shoots it down or something. <laughs> Let's talk about NYPD, and we're going to get into some creepy stuff. This is the NYPD's helicopter. It's not two guys going, oh, you know, there's a traffic jam down there. The electronics are so sophisticated, they need essentially a weapons operator. He sits back there and he runs, runs the surveillance stuff. This thing from two kilometers away, which, what's that, a mile? 1.4 miles, can look into your car and see what you're doing. 
How do I know that? Because there was actually a case of a guy a few weeks ago sitting in a car with a gun. You know, our police are badly paid, but they're not idiots. They said, the man's in the car with a gun. There's nobody in there with him. You know, let's leave him alone there for a second and figure out what to do. They called in the helicopter. The helicopter looked into the car and saw that he already shot himself. And they went over and took him off to the morgue. This thing can look right into your car, see what you're doing. Frankly, it can see what you're reading if it's at an appropriate altitude. Now, this is the wave of the future. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. The NYPD is putting out these cameras, which are day-night cameras. They never sleep. They never go on a bathroom break. You put it on post. It watches the area forever. And with facial recognition technology and activity recognition technology, it knows what's going on 24-7. Now, let me tell you about this one, this one camera. I was doing, whoop. I was doing a job in Brooklyn. And at the time, I was dating a girl in the Midwood area. So it was convenient for me to take the subway to Newkirk Avenue, get off at Newkirk Avenue, walk a couple of blocks to her house. Being an investigator and being Steve, I noticed that this particular subway station was ringed with these surveillance cameras. You could not move without being on film. Now, that's Newkirk Avenue. In my travels, I said, why this train station? Five stations in either direction, not a single camera. Go a little bit over to the F line, 10 stations, not a single camera. Only this one station, Newkirk Avenue. Here's an aerial shot. That building, that's the station. You go out the right, you go out the left, those are the only two doors, cameras. You walk down the block, camera. You walk down the block the other way, camera. You can't go into that station, you can't go out of that station, meaning you cannot access public transportation in that neighborhood without being videoed 24-7. This is the most intense coverage that I'm aware of in New York City. They don't even have this at Herald Square where they really, really need it. One door, another door front and back of the station. This is a lot of money and really sophisticated. Local area network connected by microwave. If you look at the other camera, transmitting to a central station. Completely surrounding. Why? So one Sunday I was visiting my girlfriend and what did I see? That's the neighborhood. Normally I got there one at night, two at night, nobody on the streets. You know, maybe I should have noticed the falafel stands, the, the shish kebab places, but I didn't. This is the neighborhood. These are real photos of Coney Island Avenue, two blocks from the station, on Pakistan Day Parade. So I said, you know, it's starting to look like this unique coverage where they want to see everybody entering and leaving the neighborhood at this particular choke point is because this is the most intensely Muslim neighborhood in New York. So obviously, I went to census.gov, and I pulled up neighborhood concentrations by religion. The X is where the station is. The light green and the dark green, concentration of foreign-born, foreign-speaking people. The dark green, 75% or better. So coincidence? Maybe, probably not. That's the new trend. And what you have to remember is it's not just cameras. It's facial recognition. It's activity recognition. You know, when I think of, of, of our great trans fat killing mayor, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, the first thing that comes to mind, and those of you that live in New York are going to see this right away when I say it, what immediately comes to mind is Montgomery Burns on The Simpsons. 
I mean, this guy is a guy who lives in a mansion, you know, with the little button, release the hounds, and, and has no sense of what it's like to be a normal person. And I guarantee you that when the NYPD tech services people came to him and said, we're going to give you a million cameras, and the cameras aren't going to have to be watched. We're going to program them so they can sense if the guy's a criminal, if he's doing something wrong, if he's a guy we're looking for. I got to do this. And of course, exactly. And of course, <laughs> Mayor Bloomberg went, excellent. <laughs> I really believe that. New York City, one of the things that they're doing to increase the number of cameras quickly, they're going to private industry, they're saying, you have a camera. We're going to help you maintain the camera. Just give us the video feed from it also. Thousands of people have said yes. New York City is paying half a billion dollars to Lockheed to install cameras everywhere in the subway, just like the ones you saw with artificial intelligence built in. Congestion pricing, most of you remember that there was going to be congestion pricing. Did you ever wonder how they were going to know what cars were entering the box? The answer was, everywhere all over Manhattan, today they are now installing license plate readers. It's not just cameras anymore. They have activity recognition, smart surveillance, analytics, facial recognition, license plate readers. These are cameras that can figure out what you're doing from a pre-programmed configuration. Now, I'm putting this up as an example, but also because it's the creepiest thing possible. This is a schoolyard. Now, these cameras were originally developed for, for prisons. So I guess they forgot to put in a new program for the schoolyard camera. So you have like that kid making a break for it over there. <laughs> but but these, are, these are labeled chat, play, eat, study, play, and then alert, suspicious behavior. If you've got a guy sitting in front of a bank of a thousand monitors, the cameras are watching themselves, and only when this software detects there's something that may be of interest does it start blinking, and then the human comes over and goes, oh yeah, that's a guy with a gun, okay. Facial recognition programs. When I put this up at Stevens Institute two years ago, 15 U.S. states had facial recognition. It's now 22. By the end of 2009, 41 states will have it. All, pass, all U.S. passports now go through facial recognition and all foreign passports of people entering. It's so easy to implement that even campuses are using it. University of Colorado a year and a half ago had a pot smoke in. A lot of the people wear glasses and of course there was a haze of smoke obscuring their faces. The security department of U of C got a facial recognition program took 105 photos, I believe it was, of the pot smokers, ran it against the, the student ID card photos. They caught 100 out of the 105, suspended them all. Okay, here's real world. IBM's Watson Lab, which helps develop these facial recognition programs and activity programs, they're set up where you drive into the parking lot, you park your car, it looks at the car, it says that's Bob's car, Guy gets out of the car, stands up, fixes his tie. Camera says, okay, that's Bob. Bob